in this film, we shall not only prove beyond all reasonable doubt that many of the official NASA images of lunar exploration are fake, but we shall also examine the motives for the biggest lie put before the world. Why did NASA repeatedly fake lunar images and photographs? Why did NASA stage lunar expeditions which did not happen? The answer will surprise you. NASA spent gigantic sums of money during the 1960s, but most of it was spent on the ground, not in space. Huge American corporations, many of which were manufacturing hardware for the military, made gigantic profits designing space vehicles and more importantly, life-sized models of spaceships and even huge stage sets resembling the lunar surface. Someone in NASA had realized that after taking billions of dollars from the American people, if they couldn't make it to the moon, they would fake it to the moon. Obviously, if you're going to somewhere that nobody has been before, you need to have a simulator which recreates that environment as closely as you can. If you're going to the moon, you recreate the surface of the moon. And here we see a section of the lunar surface created. It's about 30 foot high, 30 foot long, 35 foot long. Scale is given by the two people standing in front of them. There were plenty of simulation exercises, but the point is, and this is, should be taken into account in virtually everything that is discussed with the Apollo program, 400,000 people may have worked on the program in total, but none of them had a need to know more than his own job required. The people who were making the rockets didn't know what the people who were making the spacesuits were doing because they had no need to know about that. Their job was to make the best models and the best uh, simulation of the lunar surface that they could. And if we come up to this picture here, we see the three scales on which these models were built. We have here the whole moon as one unit. It stands about 20 foot high. We have here behind it a section of the surface of the moon. You'll notice it's curved. And here we have a more detailed section of the lunar surface. What you're saying is that the images which we're told show a camera pointing out the window of the lunar module as it's coming into land on the moon could well have been filmed previously using these large-scale models. That's right. It could well be that what we are looking at are films of realistic models. We have no means of knowing if they were actually taken on the lunar surface or whether what we're watching is part of the simulation exercise and the training exercise. And you'll notice here, on these models, there is a camera track. A camera starting at this end, coming down here, would approach the moon, or appear to approach the moon, and become ever closer towards it. This is a simulation rig that was built. Uh, this is the command and service module of the Apollo program. And you'll notice that the window here looks out onto a block here, and there's another one here, they're curved. These are the screens onto which the lunar surface was projected as the craft made a simulated approach towards the lunar surface. Is what we're seeing a mixture of fact and fiction? It is fact, it is fiction. It's mixed together. It's hard to separate them until you examine it closely. If a spacecraft is in deep space, the only possible explanation for a light seen through the window of the spacecraft is the sun. It's the only bright light in space. If it's not the sun, then it has to be some other artificial light, which implies that that particular image is possibly fiction. 
July 1961. NASA was soon being criticized for the flimsy construction of their hardware. The first orbital capsules did not even have windows in them for the astronauts to look out of. One of the most vocal critics was one of NASA's most respected astronauts, an all-American hero named Virgil Gus Grissom, who almost drowned when recovery helicopters were unable to lift his space capsule from the sea. After a successful journey into space, Gus Grissom almost died through NASA's bad planning. Or was this an early attempt to silence Gus Grissom? May 1963. Astronaut Gordon Cooper experiences re-entry problems in his Faith 7 rocket ship. The prototype lunar module, known as the LIM, had serious stability problems. At this stage, there was no guarantee that even if NASA managed to get a spaceship orbiting the moon, they could land safely without killing the crew. Could the footage which we see of the limb approaching the moon be filmed in a TV studio? It was filmed in a TV studio. There's absolutely no doubts whatsoever about that. And the way that this film was created was by the use of models. There's nothing secret about the models. They exist. You can go and see them today. The models were very lifelike, very realistic. There is one that is a life-size model. It's in Flagstaff in Arizona. It's two miles long, and it's an exact replica of the Sea of Tranquility. The photographs were used to create from those images the replica of the Sea of Tranquility, so that if it was flown over in a helicopter, it would appear as if it was a spacecraft approaching a similar area to land. So yes, all the scenes of the lunar surface were filmed on Earth. radiation and without having spacesuits nor spacecraft which can protect the occupants from radiation NASA convinced the American people to pay 40 billion dollars for the space program the most lethal forms of radiation of course are at the higher end of the spectrum that's gamma rays and x-rays uh, we know what ultraviolet can do. If you stay out too long in the sun, you get sunburn and skin cancer and die, and it's all very sad. But gamma rays, and x-rays especially, are particularly lethal to humans, unprotected humans. There was no protection that I have been able to identify. I've been found no reference to it. I found nothing that will tell me what level of protection is offered. So I have to assume none was. I've contacted the manufacturers of the spacesuits and they said there was no radiation protection built into the spacesuits because I asked them if these same spacesuits could be used by technicians to go into Chernobyl or Three Mile Island because the nuclear reactors produce the same radiation as produced in space. They said no, not advisable, no protection. The media focused on the Explorer 1 achievement as, at last, legitimizing the U.S. as a worthy adversary to confront the communist Sputniks. The public seemed captivated with the propaganda created by this new space race. Dr. Van Allen and his students, however, chose to focus on the data that was returning from their scientific instrument inside Explorer 1. 
when the first results came back, the, the group at the University of Iowa, this was uh, Van Allen and Ernie Ray then, began to help with it, eventually Carl McElwain. Uh, saw immediately that there was an anomaly, there was something unexpected. Uh, by the way, there's a small problem with going to the moon and inch by inch NASA is leaking out that they know that there's a problem there. It's called the Van Allen belts, high radiation belts of charged particles around Earth and we don't know how to get through them, they say. Well, isn't that interesting because there sure didn't seem to be a problem back in 1969. <laughs> Obviously, they didn't go to the moon. The United States did not go to the moon. The Russians knew it all along. Uh, I thought at the time we did, but I've since learned we absolutely did not. And there's no question about it and they're starting to figure it out. NASA has a program called Living with a Star. That's a pretty name for how do we get through the Van Allen belts. They have all their top scientists working on it. It's a tremendous problem because we do not have any kind of a spacecraft that we can send up that doesn't have metal in it. And when these charged particles hit metal, they produce x-rays. Nothing you can do to get around that. So anybody sitting around something metal in outer space in the Van Allen belts is going to be French fried. And so that whole thing was a giant hoax. And you have second and third tier scientists in the United States who are running around saying, oh, yes, we did, yes, we did. But the very top level people, what I call the tier one scientists, the black op mill scientists, know for a fact we didn't go. And it's a real problem. They don't know how to get through there. This picture is with the new Hubble camera. And it shows that, in fact, if you take this angular distance out to Pluto and you translate it into the surface of the moon, we can, in fact, resolve the landing sites, the alleged lunar landing sites. And the way you would do this is you take the pictures at dusk when the shadows became very long and it would be a very hard thing for them to fake. So at any rate, we have telescopes on Earth that are much larger than the Hubble, much better resolving power. So why you would think these astronomers would be chomping at the bit to show you those lunar landing sites. And look at the incredible resolving power of this telescope we have here. Why have none of them done that? Because there ain't nothing there. The difficulties one would encounter while trying to land a man on the moon and return safely to Earth are truly astounding. The moon has a harsh environment, with the surface temperature ranging from minus 170 degrees Fahrenheit in the shadows to 250 degrees Fahrenheit in the sunlight. It is also a vacuum. To think that men made it there and back a third of a century ago is quite a stretch. This should be apparent when one looks at how the space shuttle has fared going only 1 600th the distance that Apollo claims to have gone. It is just outright unscientific and pathological to accept the moon landing claim given the total lack of confirmation and inability to duplicate anything that even slightly approaches the alleged events of 1969. Of course, by far the greatest mystery in all this is why the scientific community continues to fall for all this and accept it unquestioningly. Is science just another religion that has its sacred cows? If you want to stay in the club, must you defend the beloved cow no matter how badly it stinks? Since nearly all of academia is dependent on funding from the federal government, any scientist brave enough to speak the truth would be committing career suicide. Scientists realize this and therefore will not let their minds examine this objectively for even a moment. They all just prefer to run with the herd. As victims of cognitive dissonance, so-called scientists argue in support of the moon landings out of reflex. If one examines a timeline of aviation and space travel milestones, this contradiction of logic becomes apparent. Consider Kitty Hawk in 1903. Lindbergh crossing the Atlantic in 1927, Sputnik in 1957, 
through the space shuttle in the latter part of the 20th century. These were all within 400 miles of Earth. Yet the alleged moon landings of the late 60s purportedly took astronauts 240,000 miles away from the Earth. The Apollo missions, therefore, stick out as a fantastic statistical anomaly. And without any other similar events to confirm or duplicate the hypothesized event, one third of a century since, the scientific method requires that they be discarded. This being the case, no one that believes the moon landing claim should be allowed to call themselves a scientist. The Cold War provided the perfect motivation for the deception. Under the specter of a nuclear threat from the Soviets, and in the shadow of the Bay of Pigs invasion, it is easy to imagine those involved believing that it was their patriotic duty to help bluff the Soviets into thinking we had military superiority. It apparently worked. A nuclear war was never fought, so we are certainly in no position to second-guess the military strategy that the government employed. With the space race officially ending with this achievement, Nixon was quick to seize the spotlight by becoming the first U.S. president to visit Moscow. Cooperation for joint space missions quickly became the topic of discussion between the leaders, ushering in detente and easing of tensions between the two superpowers. Uh, as you're probably well aware, we are still working on other programs, Skylab being the prime effort starting in the spring of, the, of uh, next year. Uh, we're also working on the uh, cooperative mission with the Russians, which will take place in 1975. And of course, we've got quite a few of uh, the flight control team as well as other center elements involved in the work on the shuttle. So it's, it's the start of a new era, I hope. It is easy to see why the government would want to perpetuate such a myth, even after the military objectives were achieved. The alleged accomplishment is a source of national pride and no one wants to be the one to remove this source of pride. It would also not come as a surprise to find out that in upper levels of certain agencies, the moon landing hoax is actually somewhat of an inside joke, in that within these institutions, those that have attained a certain level are entrusted with this secret information.